What a joy it is to see Jehovah's organization on the move. Not only is the increase seen in the numbers of those proclaiming the acceptable year of our God, but it is also evident in the quality of their preaching activity and in the growth and quality of the spiritual paradise resulting from this activity. How extensive is your personal share in these blessings from Jehovah? When we see the tremendous shout of praise going up to our grand creator, are our hearts filled with pleasure at the part we have been privileged to play individually? Or do we think of what might have been done? What matters is not how much we have done, but the zeal we have put into our effort. Jesus said of the widow, who dropped just two coins of little value into the treasure chest. This poor widow dropped in more than all, for they all dropped in out of their surplus, but she, out of her want, dropped in all of what she had, her whole living. There are many such like individuals in Jehovah's organization today who give generously of their funds and field service efforts. But there are others whose service and monetary contributions are not so whole-souled. How many have an apathetic view of the work, not feeling for one reason or another the need to exert themselves vigorously in the service of the king? They are not following the example of our Lord during his earthly ministry, as was written of him at John 2.17. The zeal for your house will eat me up. What can we do to stimulate such ones to a fuller share in promoting kingdom interests? As Paul urged, Do not loiter at your business. Be aglow with the Spirit, slave for Jehovah. To slack off in our sacred service in this final part of the days, being satisfied with only a token share is to invite disaster. The drama you will now hear is called Doing God's Will with Zeal. How will it affect you? I thoroughly enjoyed your meeting with our body of elders, Brother Elmsley. None of us realized how much the congregation's activity and increase were due mainly to the work of our pioneers and just a few of our regular publishers. Your congregation's average hours are high, and you're getting good increase, and you have only a few irregular publishers. On the surface, it's a good report. But if you take out the few high-hour publishers, the average is quite low. I can see that now. And as service overseer, I'm concerned about those who might be able to do more. Your suggestion that we use the Watchtower Publications Index to find ideas on increasing our ministry has already proved to be a real help. I've started to make a list of ideas and experiences I found under such headings as witnessing and informal witnessing those I thought might be of special help to some particular publisher. I found it very encouraging and stimulating just to read them myself. They do open up new avenues for us and also encourage us to more zealous activity. They sure do. And I'm glad, too, you could make this shepherding call with me on Sue Myers. Something must have happened to cause her to drop off in her ministry so drastically in such a short time. I've never been able to find out her problem. 
We'll have to look into that, Mike. We need to know what the problem is, or even if there is one, before we can do anything to help her, or even know where to start. Well, this is where she lives. I'll ring the bell. I'm sure you'll like Sue. She really is a fine sister. I hope we'll be able to help her. We'll sure try. Hello, Sue. Hello. We appreciate your letting us drop by for a few minutes. It's very kind of you and Brother Elmsley to visit me. Won't you come in? Thank you, Sister Myers. I thought you might like a cup of coffee or tea or something. Would you like to sit here? I feel so formal sitting in the living room. This is fine. Whatever you have is all right with me. Me too. We're glad to have you and Sister Elmsley with our congregation this week. I met Sister Elmsley at the meeting. She's very nice. Thank you. I know this isn't just a social call, or you'd have brought your wives. Besides, I'm sure you don't have much time for that anyway. You've come to talk to me about my field service, haven't you? We are interested in your service to Jehovah, yes. Just as we know you are, too. Brother O'Connor's been very helpful, and he's encouraged me. But lately, I just don't seem able to do as much as I did at one time. Do you have any idea why you don't? As much as you used to? Well, no. Some of the magazines I really enjoy placing. And some you don't, is that right? Yes. Could I ask what kind? I don't know. Well, don't you think sometimes we may overemphasize uh, Armageddon and the uh, Great Tribulation? I can appeal to people much more when I talk to them about the blessings of the kingdom. Yes, we do need to give them that hope. Paul says it's an anchor for our soul. It spurs us on helps us get through the trials. And it's a definite part of the kingdom message. Here, let me show you. Jesus called attention to his commission foretold by Isaiah at Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord Jehovah is upon me, for the reason that Jehovah has anointed me to tell good news to the meek ones. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to those taken captive, and the wide opening of the eyes, even to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of goodwill on the part of Jehovah. And notice this, the day of vengeance on the part of our God. That makes this a very necessary part of the kingdom message. But some say we're frightening people into becoming Jehovah's Witnesses, like some do in preaching hellfire. You don't believe that yourself, do you? No, but I was raised a Catholic, and I know how the teaching of hellfire can affect you. Were you affected that way? Yes, when I was a child. But were you frightened by Armageddon into dedication and baptism? No. In fact, it was a real relief to learn that hell is the grave and that there'll be a resurrection. Did you ever hear anyone say that their hell is right here on earth? My sister says that all the time. Then don't you think it would be a relief to her to know that Armageddon will get rid of conditions like that? The paradise earth just won't be possible until Satan's system is cleared out. I know, but she objects mostly to what we print about the Catholic Church. Like those articles we had in the Watchtower on Babylon the Great. I had sent her a gift subscription. But when she saw what was printed about the Catholic Church, she told me never to talk to her about the truth again. Yes, it's true that some people believe it's wrong to criticize another's religion. But Jesus did, didn't he? I'm sure you don't think he was wrong, do you? No, of course not. But he was Jesus. That's true. But he did set an example for us, didn't he? To follow his footsteps closely. Let me ask you this, Sue. What was Jesus referring to when he said he was commissioned to proclaim liberty to those taken captive, and the wide opening of the eyes even to the prisoners? It was religious error, wasn't it? How can they be freed from religious error unless these God-dishonoring doctrines are exposed? But my sister won't listen to that. She doesn't believe they're wrong. 
Well, that's what she's been taught all her life. But so were you, weren't you? And something or someone prompted you to listen, to find out the truth. We have to remember that many didn't listen to Jesus either, did they? But did that dampen his zeal one bit? No. John quoted Jesus as saying to his father, The zeal for your house will eat me up. He was even more determined than ever to uphold Jehovah's name and the true worship of his father, because he knew this would liberate those who did have hearing ears. Aren't you glad the brother or sister who brought you the truth was not discouraged because many don't listen? Yes. Do you think we should hold back from exposing false worship to those who do have listening hearts, just because some refuse? I suppose not. But it isn't easy to face those who are so opposed. That's very true, Sue. Recall Jeremiah. It wasn't easy for him either. But remember how Jehovah made him like an iron pillar and copper walls against all the land. His zeal for Jehovah spurred him on to proclaim Jehovah's judgments against them. It was like a fire in his bones that he could not contain. But now, think of this for a moment. Jeremiah's commission was merely to proclaim Jehovah's judgments. It would be a far harder task for a servant of Jehovah who was commissioned to execute those false worshipers, wouldn't it? Like Jehu. You recall Jehu. I surely do. A real man of action. He tolerated no rivalry toward Jehovah. But what gave him such zeal? Let's look it up. The record begins in 2 Kings 9. As you may recall, Jehu rode a chariot behind King Ahab. Queen Jezebel had conspired to have innocent Naboth killed so that Ahab could possess Naboth's vineyard. Jehu was present when Elijah then came to Ahab with God's judgment against him and his entire house. He said that not one of Ahab's relationship would remain because of his and Jezebel's blood guilt, and they're going after Baal in worship. Jehovah fooled Ahab so that he went up to the battle in which he died. To get the setting of the events that followed, we'll begin with 2 Kings 8, 25, and read down to chapter 9, verse 2. In the twelfth year of Jehoram, the son of Ahab, the king of Israel, Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, the king of Judah, became king. Twenty-two years old was Ahaziah when he began to reign, and for one year he reigned in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Athaliah, the granddaughter of Omri, the king of Israel. And he went walking in the way of the house of Ahab, and kept doing what was bad in Jehovah's eyes, like the house of Ahab. For he was a relative of the house of Ahab by marriage. Accordingly, he went with Jehoram, the son of Ahab, to the war against Hazael, the king of Syria. As for Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, the king of Judah, he went down to see Jehoram, the son of Ahab, in Jezreel, for he was sick. And Elisha the prophet, for his part, called one of the sons of the prophets, and then said to him, Gird up your loins, and take this flask of oil in your hand, and go to Ramoth Gilead. When you have come in there, see Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi there. And you must come in and make him get up from the midst of his brothers, and bring him into the innermost chamber. Jehoram's wounds will heal in time. It was not fatally that he was struck. He isn't needed here in Ramoth Gilead anyway. Haziel's defeat was complete. Jehu, do you think the king of Syria will attack again soon? Not soon, Bidkar. Our position in Ramoth Gilead is secure now for some time, I'm sure. Ben Hadad was a man of war. But this successor of his, Haziel, He's a violent and ambitious man. And yet I understand that Elisha himself anointed him as king of Syria. Do you believe that is so, Jehu? You would believe a bird that flew into the window, Shishan. But what right does a man of God have to anoint a king of Syria? It was a commission received by Elijah from Jehovah himself. Elisha fulfilled that commission as his successor. However, he did not anoint Hazael with oil. What do you mean? Well... 
When Hazael went to Elisha to inquire as to Ben-Hadad's recovery from illness, Elisha simply told him, Ben-Hadad will recover, but he will die. Jehovah has shown me you as king over Syria. But that's what prompted Haziel to kill Ben-Hadad. He would have covered it and put it over Ben-Hadad's face so that he was smothered. You're right, Shishan. And Haziel became king in his place. What about that, Jehu? This sin cannot be laid to Elisha. It was Hazael's own ambition that prompted it. But it's just that Ben-Hadad died. As you'll recall, Jehoshaphat joined with Ahab in his campaign to regain this city, Ramoth Gilead. It was in the hand of Ben-Hadad, remember? In that encounter, Ben-Hadad ordered the 32 chiefs of the chariots to fight with no one but Ahab. But it was Jehoshaphat they went after instead. He nearly lost his life in that encounter. I remember. That's right, because Ahab disguised himself, but Jehoshaphat did not. What was a zealous man like Jehoshaphat, a true worshiper of Jehovah, doing fighting alongside a man like Ahab, anyway? Perhaps Jehoshaphat thought he could unite the two kingdoms. Uh, did he not make a marriage alliance with the house of Ahab by marrying his own son to Athaliah, the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel? That's your guess, Shishan. You don't know why Jehoshaphat made a covenant with Ahab. Uh, Whatever his reason, and however well motivated it may have been on his part, Jehovah condemned it because he was unevenly yoked with an unbeliever. But because Jehoshaphat was zealous for true worship, Jehovah showed him mercy, or else he would have died that day along with Ahab. Ahab's end was certain. He may have thought that by disguising himself he could defy the judgment of Jehovah pronounced by Elijah. But that's foolish. An arrow was shot at random by a Syrian soldier hit him between the joints of his armor and killed him. But did you not tell us, Jehu, that you and Bikar were there when Elijah pronounced that judgment? And he said that all Ahab's house was to be annihilated, and that even Jezebel was to be eaten by the dogs. How many years have passed since Elijah spoke that prophecy to Ahab? But Ahab did die, and the dogs did lick up his blood, just the way the judgment said it would happen. True, but it's been 14 years since Ahab died, and nothing else has happened. And now Jehoram, the son of Ahab and Jezebel, rules in Samaria. And Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram's sister Athaliah, has ruled in Judah for a year. Where's the prophecy of Jehovah? Don't speak lightly of the prophecy or the judgment of Jehovah. And don't deceive yourself into thinking that Jehovah has forgotten. Jehovah's word is certain to be carried out. Look. Who is this one approaching? There is a word I have for you, O chief. For which one of all of us? For you, O chief. Come into the house. This is what Jehovah, the God of Israel, has said. I do anoint you as king over Jehovah's people, that is, over Israel. And you must strike down the house of Ahab, your Lord, and I must avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the servants of Jehovah at the hand of Jezebel. And the whole house of Ahab must perish. And I must constitute the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Baasha, the son of Ahijah. And Jezebel, the dogs will eat up in the tract of land at Jezreel, and there will be no one burying her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is everything all right? Why did this crazy man come in to you? You yourselves know the sons of the prophets and their kind of talk. No, we don't. Tell us, please. What did the man say? He spoke like this what and What was like... his message? And then he said to me, This is what Jehovah has said. I do anoint you as king over Israel. Blow the horn, Shishan. Jehu has become Jehu king. Jehu has become king. If now your soul is with my soul, do not let anyone escape from the city to go and make report in Jezreel. 
Prepare the chariots. We ride at once to Jezreel. Yeah, yeah! It's good to see that your wounds are healing so well, Jehoram. I'll soon be ready for another encounter with Hazael. I'll not rest until I've pushed them back into Syria for all time to come. There is a heaving mass of men that I am seeing. Jadok! You called, my lord. You heard the watchman? Yes, my lord. Take a cavalryman and set him to meet them, and let him say, is there peace? At once, my lord. What does this mean, Jehoram? Who would the heaving mass be? How can I know? That's why I've sent a cavalryman to meet them. Could it be Haziel? It's very unlikely. I left Jehu with a garrison of men at Ramoth Gilead. Jehu is a good man. He rode chariot behind my father Ahab. He wouldn't let Haziel through. The messenger came as far as to them, but he has not returned. Jadok. Yes, my lord. Send a second rider and let him say, is there peace? At once, my lord. Can you make out anything, Jehoram? Only the dust from this distance, but the horseman approaches quickly. He came as far as to them, but he has not returned. And the driving is like the driving of Jehu, the grandson of Nimshai, for it is with madness that he drives. Jadok, Madana, hitch up. And my war chariot also. Jehu rides so furiously. Something is not right. I will see to it myself. Why has he left Ramoth Gilead? Madana, come up here and remain with Jezebel while Jadok and I ride out to investigate. As you say, my lord. What's happening, Maeka? What do you see? Uh, nothing, my lady. Nothing, you stupid girl. Surely you must see something. Nothing but dust, my lady. My lord the king is riding furiously to meet Jehu. Get away from the window, you daughter of a worthless maid. Matana, you have eyes. Tell me what's going on out there. Yes, my lady. It's even as Maeka has said. There's a great cloud of dust. Am I surrounded by fools? Let me see. Ugh, there's nothing but a cloud of dust. Yes, my lady. But the dust cloud of my lord the king is approaching the dust cloud of Jehu. I have eyes. I can see that much, you fool. But what are they doing? The two dust clouds have merged. They're but one now. And it looks like they've come to a stop by the tract of land of Naboth the Jezreelite. Maybe now we'll be able to see something. Look, it's Jadok, riding furiously toward us. Now his dust is getting in the way. All I can see is Jadok scurrying back to the house. Perhaps we'll know soon. Jadok is approaching the courtyard. Oh, my soul! A conspiracy! A conspiracy! What do you mean? What is happening? Alas, my lady, I have only calamitous news for you. Well, speak! What is this conspiracy, this calamity? The two kings met up with Jehu in the tract of land of Naboth the Jezreelite. I was following close after them, and I heard Jehoram call out, Is there peace, Jehu? Well, could you hear Jehu's reply? Only partly, my lady. Well, what did he say, partly? Speak. He said, what peace could there be as long as there are... Uh... As long as there are what, J-Doc? Speak up, you fool. What went on out there? He said, as long as there are the fornications of Jezebel, your mother, <gasps> and her Treason! many sorceries. I can't see. There are only figures in the distance. What did Jehoram reply? He called out to Ahaziah, there is trickery, Ahaziah. And they both turned to flee. But Jehu himself took a bow 
and shot Jehoram between the arms. <gasps> the arrow came out at his heart, and he collapsed in his chariot. Treason! Treachery! She who must die for this. Here, Maica, fix my hair and paint my eyes. At once, my lady. I would welcome Jehu. What happened next, Jadok? Jehu said to Bidkar, Lift him up. Throw him into the tract of the field of Naboth the Jezreelite. Then I turned to leave, and he said something about he and Bidkar riding teams behind Ahab, and how Jehovah himself lifted up a pronouncement against Ahab there in that tract of land. We were there too when Elijah said it, remember? Hmm. And heard him ourselves say, Certainly the blood of Naboth and the blood of his sons I saw yesterday, and I shall certainly repay you in this tract of land, is the utterance of Jehovah. Look! Jehu's approaching the courtyard. He must have executed Ahaziah also. Did it go all right with Simri, the killer of his lord? Who is with me? Who? Treason! Treachery! May the gods repay you! You will die for this! Let her drop! Now, Matana. Ah! Please, my lord, sit here. You must be hungry and thirsty. Here is wine and bread. This day has been a long time in arriving, Jehu. But until today, Matana, I was not sure of you. As I served Ahab and Jehoram, so I shall serve Jehu. Jehu has been anointed king. And I will not rest until all of Jehovah's word against Ahab's house has been fulfilled. But come now, Jadok, take care of this accursed one and bury her, for she is the daughter of a king. It shall be done. Do you really know, Matana, that Jehovah has commissioned me to strike down the house of Ahab? and to avenge the blood of all the servants of Jehovah shed at the hand of Jezebel? It is good. We have really waited for this day. Then you will see my zeal for toleration of no rivalry toward Jehovah. There are others, too. Who... It's too late, my lord. Bidkar has just told us what happened. And when we went to bury her, we didn't find anything of her. But the skull and the feet and the palms of the hands... It is the word of Jehovah. In the tract of land of Jezreel, the dogs will eat the flesh of Jezebel, and the dead body of Jezebel will certainly become as manure upon the face of the field in the tract of land of Jezreel, that they may not say, This is Jezebel. And so the word of Jehovah will always prove to be true. But the word of Jehovah against Ahab's house is not yet finished. Jadok, write this letter to the princes of Jezreel, the older men and the caretakers of Ahab. Jehu, to the older men of Samaria. Jehoram, the son of Ahab, your lord, is dead at the hand of Jehu. Now then, at the very time that this letter comes to you, there are with you the sons of your lord, and there are with you the war chariots and the horses and a fortified city and the armor. And you must see which is the best and most upright of the sons of your Lord and put him upon the throne of his father in place of Jehoram. Then fight for the house of your Lord. Bidkar, deliver copies of the letter to Samaria at once. We must act quickly. It shall be done, my Lord.
What news do you have from the princes, Bidkar? Is it war? The princes have become very much afraid, my lord. I came in to the one who is over the city, and the older men when they were with the one who is over the house. And they said, Does Jehu send you in peace, Bidkar? I gave them the letter that you had written, and the one who was over the city read it aloud to the others. They began to tremble and to say to one another, Look, two kings themselves did not stand before Jehu. And how shall we ourselves stand? So they sent you this word. We are your servants, and everything that you say to us, we shall do. We shall not make anyone king. What is good in your own eyes, do. They speak well, Bidkar. It's good. Tell me now, where are the sons of Ahab? Are they in hiding? Or are they there with the princes and older men? They're with the older men, but they were not present when the letter was read. You've done well, Bidkar. Jadok, write this second letter to the principal men. At once, my lord. This is what you'll write. Jehu, to the princes of Jezreel, the older men and the caretakers of Ahab. The word you have spoken to me is good. If then you belong to me, and it is my voice that you are obeying, take the heads of the men that are sons of your Lord, and come to me tomorrow at this time at Jezreel. The king's sons, seventy persons whom the great men are rearing. Bidkar, take Shishan with you, and a detachment of men, and see that it is done even as I have written to them. And if they refuse, they will not, when they see you are not alone. But if they do, return at once. It will be done, my lord. It would seem that Jehu's zeal against the house of Ahab has not abated. Nor will it. Do you not agree that he is the executioner of Jehovah's judgment according to the prophecy of Elijah? You joined with me in throwing Jezebel down to the courtyard of Ahab's Jezebel house. Jezebel was a wicked woman. She deserved to die. Do all of Ahab's sons and grandsons have the same guilt that she did? You do not approve of Jehu's order of execution sent to the princes of Jezreel. Did Jehovah hold Saul guiltless for the massacre of the priests at Nob? How can you compare the murder of those faithful priests of the true God Jehovah with the execution of these Baal-worshipping sons of Ahab? It's Jehovah's own declaration of judgment against them. Did you say that because of the pronouncement of Elijah? Yes, I heard him, and so did you. How can we be sure it's really God's judgment and that... God's anger will not be turned upon us. It is God's judgment. Jehu is Jehovah's anointed executioner. Take care, Matana, that you do not yourself bring God's anger upon you by actually fighting against God. Principal men have carried out your order against all seventy of the sons of the king, my lord. It's good. Their heads have been brought here in baskets. The baskets are in the courtyard, and the men await your word. Put them in two heaps at the entrance of the gate of the city until morning. It will be done, my lord. Must this indignity also be put upon these men who were sons of a king? The people must be made to know for a certainty that Jehovah's judgment has been carried out and that he has made my anointing as king absolute and beyond dispute. Might they not rather be appalled at the sight and their consciences be stricken? 
You people are innocent. It's true that I conspired against my lord, and I got to kill him. But that does not make me a common murderer. See who struck down all these sons of the king, the most eminent men in Samaria. Does that make them just murderers? Of course not. They and I are only Jehovah's sword for the execution of Jehovah's decree. Know then that nothing of Jehovah's word will fall unfulfilled to the earth that Jehovah has spoken against the house of Ahab. And Jehovah himself has done what he spoke by means of his servant Elijah. There are still those who are left over of the house of Ahab in Jezreel. And all his distinguished men, and his acquaintances, and his chief officers. These too must be struck down until there is no survivor of Ahab's left remaining. We must see to it at once, for I must get on my way to Samaria. Bidkar, take Shishan and get the men ready. Jadok, you and Matana must precede us to Samaria, and prepare a proclamation to be sent out when you arrive in Samaria. Collect all the people together and say to them, Ahab on the one hand worshipped Baal a little, Jehu on the other hand will worship him a great deal. So now call all the prophets of Baal, all his worshippers, and all his priests to me. Do not let a single one be missing, because I have a great sacrifice for Baal. Anyone that is missing will not keep living. What will you do now, Matana? It is the order of the king. And will you join with the worshippers of Baal? As I served Ahab, so will I serve Jehu. As he does, so will I do. You are a fool, Matana. Is that the way you view the zeal of Jehu in his service of Jehovah? Jehovah is the king of Israel. Jehu! Why, Jehonadab! May Jehovah be with you. I had hoped I would find you. I have heard of your victories in Jehovah's cause. I've been looking for you ever since I heard you'd slaughtered 42 relatives of Ahaziah on your way to Samaria. Is your heart upright with me just as my own heart is with your heart? It is. If it is, give me your hand. Get up into my chariot. Go along with me. Look upon my toleration of no rivalry toward Jehovah. I didn't know there were so many worshippers of Baal in Israel. The house of Baal is packed out from end to end. They have responded well to Jehu's proclamation. It should be a great sacrifice to Baal indeed. Do you still question Jehu's reason for calling this assembly? It's just as Jehu said. 
Ahab on the one hand worshiped Baal a little, Jehu on the other hand will worship him a great deal. Does the worship of Jehovah mean so little to you? Or do you think it means so little to Jehu? Jehu has finally struck down all who were left over of Ahab's in Samaria, completely annihilating them. But what does this have to do with his worship of Jehovah? He's acted according to Jehovah's word that Jehovah had spoken to Elijah. It's because he tolerates no rivalry toward Jehovah. I know Jehu believes that Jehovah will act to fulfill his judgment against Baal, just as he has on the house of Ahab. Nevertheless, Jehu has proclaimed a solemn assembly and a great sacrifice to Baal, and I intend to be there. Has Matana entered the house to join the worshippers? Yes, my lord. And what of you, Jadok? Will you also? No, my lord. Did not I myself inform you to issue a decree for all the Baal worshippers to assemble for a great sacrifice? Excuse me, my lord. I am not a worshipper of Baal, nor was I before Ahab died, as judged by Jehovah. I am a worshipper of Jehovah. You are a good and a loyal man, Jadok. My real purpose in calling this assembly has been a well-guarded secret. You will join Jehonadab in witnessing my zeal for the execution of Jehovah's judgment against the house of Baal. All of those inside have put on their garments of identification. A careful search has been made to make certain that no worshiper of Jehovah is there. You... Bidkar and Shishan will remain here. Jehonadab and I will go inside. The burnt offering is almost complete. When it's finished, you three will enter here, as eighty others will enter from the front. It will be with you as with them. As for the man that escapes from the men whom I am bringing into your hands, the one soul will go for the other soul. Come, Jehonadab. Come in! Strike them down! What is this? What's going on? Do not let a single one escape! And the runners and the adjutants began to strike them down with the edge of the sword and to throw them out. And they kept going as far as the city of the house of Baal. Thus Jehu annihilated Baal out of Israel. Thus Jehu annihilated Baal out of Israel. Jehu certainly was a man of zeal. No question about that. Now, remember, we asked at the beginning of the account, what gave him such zeal? Sue, do you think you can give us an idea now? Was it because he was anointed by the prophet of God? That would certainly give him the authority, wouldn't it? But what would give him such an eager desire or enthusiasm to carry out his commission of execution? Right down to the very last one of Ahab's house, and every single Baal worshiper. I guess it was because he knew he was doing God's will. I'm sure of it. Besides, Jehu seemed to have a direct way about him. 
to get the job done and not put it off. Is that what it takes? Jesus said it was like food to him. He told his disciples, My food is for me to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. And Jesus is the greater Jehu. Another thing, Jehu was fearless. He must have known that he would be criticized for doing what he did, even being falsely accused as to his motives. But he did not hold back one moment. You mentioned that earlier, Brother Elmsley. What can I do to get over feeling the way I do about my sister? You love your sister, don't you? Of course. Wouldn't you like to see her get life? Surely I would. Would you read this scripture at Romans ten, thirteen through 15, please? Here, use my Bible. For everyone who calls on the name of Jehovah will be saved. However, how will they call on him in whom they have not put faith? How in turn will they put faith in him of whom they have not heard? How in turn will they hear without someone to preach? How in turn will they preach unless they have been sent forth, just as it is written, How comely are the feet of those who declare good news of good things? How could you use this text to get over feeling the way you do about your sister? I guess I've been thinking about myself, letting fear of man becloud my thinking. Instead, I should be thinking of ways to help her without offending her. As John 17, 3 says, This means everlasting life. They're taking in knowledge of you, the only true God, and of the one whom you sent forth, Jesus Christ. And Matthew seven twenty one, Not everyone saying to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of the heavens, but the one doing the will of my Father who is in the heavens will. And we might add, doing the will of the Father with zeal. That's another thing, Brother Elmsley. What gives us real zeal, as Jehu had? Do you remember what we were saying about the zeal of Jehu? Oh, yes. He knew he was doing God's will. And? And going straight to the job? These are some of the things, yes and I think of particular interest to you in the state of mind you've allowed to develop. You know, Sue, some of our brothers and sisters have developed similar patterns of thinking. They love Jehovah, and they want to do His will, but they've allowed themselves to forget temporarily the full significance of their dedication, and that is exclusive devotion to Jehovah. As a result, they fall into a pattern of self-sparing service. Some will go into the field ministry readily enough when they're asked and when someone takes them out, as it were. But left on their own, they're not too regular. They're not what we might call self-starters. Self-starters? A self-starter will go no matter what. He goes because it's become the pattern of his life. Oh, a life of zealous activity, of love of God and neighbor, and because he knows he's doing God's will. Could I become a self-starter, do you think? Of course you can. Anybody can. How? It's really quite simple. First, of course, you have to be convinced in your own mind, like Jonadab, whose heart was right with Jehu's. His parallel is found in the great crowd, who eagerly joined themselves to the greater Jehu, Jesus Christ, in his judgment work against false religion. And that isn't difficult if you take another close look at your dedication to Jehovah. Examples of others are encouraging, too. You might look up some of the references in the Watchtower Publications Index, under such headings as Witnessing and Informal Witnessing. They'll give you a real boost. I like that idea. I need all the encouragement I can get. Good. Then you sit down and make out a schedule, one that you can keep if you put kingdom interest first. Then you follow that schedule as closely as you possibly can, being honest with yourself. You stick to it until your times in the field ministry are almost automatic. After a while, you'll be setting new goals for yourself and meeting them. 
then you'll find yourself moving ahead with Jehovah's organization. And be assured, if you offer yourself to God, good things will happen to you. Thank you, Brother Elmsley and Brother O'Connor. I can't tell you how much I appreciate your taking the time to pay me this visit. It's helped me to realize how much Jehovah cares for us through his organization, and I feel it stirred me to more zealous activity. I know it's zeal on your part that's prompted you to do it. The least I can do now on my part is to make a sincere effort to follow your counsel. We're very glad to hear you say that, Sue. We've had others we visited respond in that same spirit. It's becoming more and more evident. Paul wrote at Titus 2, 11 through 14, that those delivered by Christ Jesus and who are cleansed from the world's lawless practices truly become a people zealous for fine works. example of zeal we have in Jehu. His immediate readiness and the dispatch with which he carried out his assignment to act as Jehovah's executioner is an outstanding type of Christ Jesus as the reigning king in this time of the end. The remnant eagerly joined the greater Jehu, Jesus Christ, in heart harmony with him, carrying on the work of exposing false religion. Today, the great crowd, as a fitting parallel of Jehonadab, are eagerly coming into the chariot of Jehovah's visible organization. They are zealously supporting the greater Jehu in his toleration of no rivalry toward Jehovah. They are enthusiastically sharing and exposing all false religion with its hypocrisy and unrighteousness. This is no time for apathy or slowing down. Doing God's will today calls for unrestricted zeal on the part of all of those who are in heart harmony with the faithful and discreet slave and the greater Jehu. If you are one as such, then respond to the invitation of the greater Jehu. Give him your hand. Join him in showing fervent zeal for Jehovah.